and there was a conference last week which was very successful so I hope this week will also be. Thank you Marius and thank you for inviting me. Okay, what I want to talk about is the question of integral points, integral points on cubic surfaces, very concrete classical subject about which very little is known uh, and I will explain its connection with uh, dynamics uh, and the topic of this conference as we go along. Well, everything I have to say in the first half is joint work with Amit Ghosh, <coughs> and in the second half with Jean Bourguin and Alex Gumbard. Okay, so let me look here, and you can look there. Um, actually, when Bergelson was speaking, it was this. Let's see if I can reach and point. No, <laughs> I'm a bit too short. All right. So, um, yeah, I have a signal, but I usually don't like this. Oh, okay. All right. Why not? Why not? Yeah. All right. So we take a polynomial with integer coefficients of degree n in n variables. It needn't be homogeneous as we go along, but you can think at the beginning it's homogeneous. And I'm interested in the values it assumes and the level sets, so these hypersurfaces, and to study the Diophantine equation d equals k. Now if I let x, the coordinates x get up to t, then I'll have t to the n values. On the other hand, since I'm assuming it's degree n in n variables, that's throughout this talk, <clears throat> if we degree n in n variables, then the number of values I'll assume is also t to the n. So you might expect, if the world were very fair, that I hit every number roughly the same amount of time. So the, the question of hitting a given number now becomes a quite subtle thing. It will never succumb to something like the Hardy-Littlewood circle method which would only be able to count points or solutions or in many of these ergodic problems, you're trying to count solutions where there are a tremendous number of solutions. The asymptotics as you go to infinity is very large. Here it's sort of bounded and so it looks like maybe only algebra could touch such a problem. But we will see that it's a mixture of algebra and analysis and some ergodic theory that is critical. So what kind of question are we interested in? <coughs> I look at the hypersurface and I look at are there integer points? Is the Hasse principle true, for example? So if there are congruence obstructions, obviously there are no integer points. But suppose I pass all the congruence obstructions, I have a, I could have the right to ask, maybe there are integer points. And that would be the Hasse principle, that we go from local to global. Maybe there are infinitely many solutions, or even there's a risky dense set of solutions in the hypersurface. So that, and we might even get very ambitious and ask, is strong approximation true? That is, maybe there's so many solutions that if I reduce modulo q, I get all the local solutions mod q. That would be the best of all worlds. I should say that when you have many variables, real many variables, <coughs> and you use what's called the circle method, then usually all these things are true. You just have a tremendous number of solutions and the hardy Littlewood asymptotics will give you all these things for free once it's in action. So that's our setup. And in the case of n equals 2, we're talking about a quadratic equation because it's degree 2 in two variables. If it's homogeneous, it's a binary quadratic form. And this is the content of Gauss's Disquestionis Arithmetica. He studied this problem. Which numbers are represented by binary quadratic forms? <coughs> and is there a local to global principle? And over the rationals, I mean, the most general version of this would be the hasse minkowski theorem. But when we have two variables, and degree two, we really are in the topic of what are called tori. And that's really the setting I'm here. The tori are much more difficult than when you have many variables. But of course, Gauss developed this theory, <coughs> and there's a local to global principle over the rationals. So if we look at these equations and we allow rational solutions, it's much richer and much easier, at least in this case of binary forms. Over z, it's a very tricky thing. There's a, something called the class number that intervenes to understand local to global principles, and they're not true. But average things are true. Class numbers are typically not small. In the case of n equals 2, is sort of what we're trying to understand in, when n is bigger than 2, 
but basically nothing is known. All right, so if n is bigger than 2, the only general thing that's known, and in fact a, a number of talks in this conference are very much related to that, the usual homogeneous dynamics which uses ergodic theory wherever, say, Ratner's theorem is used or measure rigidity to get equidistribution, to get local to global principles, of which there are many examples in recent years. <coughs> Those are all uh, based on a linear group action. I emphasize a linear group action. So that's uh, maybe the level sets happen to be acted on by a linear group uh, which sort of has finite number of integer orbits. And then we're in a position where ergodic theory, dynamics, and of course spectral theory of automorphic forms comes in. So the simplest example of that is a torus, which is the case of n equals 2 that Gauss had studied. And in the case of a torus, <coughs> that means that this uh, form of degree n factors into linear forms. And if it factors into linear forms, then this was studied by Dirichlet. This is the famous Dirichlet unit theorem, tells you that the let's say d is non-degenerate, then d of x equals 1, the solutions to that form an abelian group, a finitely generated abelian group, which is directly a unit group, and you can understand that problem of how many solutions there are in a ball and so on by just, uh, it's a lattice and it's a linear action. On the other hand, if you ask uh, whether you have a local to global principle, well, over the rationals, this is a basic question about which elements or norms of rationals. That's basically Hilbert's 90, theorem 90. But if you uh, ask over Z, then it's very similar to Gauss's theory and you, theorem, and you're back to class numbers of orders in number fields. So the torus is a very well understood case, and it's tricky. Let's get away from tori. We still can have a homogeneous group action. I'll illustrate it with one example. Let's take the discriminant of a binary cubic form with the action being changes of variable, linear action on two variables. Binary cubic forms, <clears throat> that's a four-dimensional vector space. The discriminant is a polynomial of degree four in four variables, homogeneous, there's the discriminant. And we're asking d equals k. And here we have a group action. I emphasize without the group action, is, I, I really know nothing, and nobody knows anything. So. We, we, we really have to get some dynamics somewhere, some action, otherwise we, in this world, have very few ways to go. So <clears throat> if I'm degree four in four variables, GL2Z acts linearly on the integer points, and it's well known they're finitely many orbits. This goes back to Klepsch and Gordon and people like that. It's a generalization of Gauss's theory. But the actual number of orbit, the number, of the finitely many orbits for each k under this linear group action this number hk, which is a class number of binary cubics, is a very mysterious quantity. Is hk zero or not? Is there a Hasse principle? We know very little about this. We do know the average. This is a famous theorem of Davenport. Uh, we do know what the average is a star here to indicate remove reducible forms. And this was used by Davenport and then Davenport and Heilbronn to count cubic fields of discriminant less than x to know which, if there's a, which, number, which k's are discriminants of cubics. This is a very subtle question. And there's a conjecture of, there are conjectures which have been checked numerically. They're probably true. They come from what are called cohen lenstra heuristics. But there's no uh, power here to, to prove anything. So that's the linear group action. Now the minute I go to, I don't have a linear group action, we are in big trouble. We don't know anything in this lecture is about introducing a family of nonlinear group actions in which we can still say a lot. And that's sort of a theory that I'm hoping will be. Uh, and it's much more exotic and much, more ri much richer than the linear case. And the varieties we would be looking at, and I'm only going to stick to one of them, and that's this cubic surface, <coughs> are the representation variety of the fundamental group of a surface of genus G with n punctures into two by two matrices. And you can make this into a variety, which is in fact defined over z. And you look at these level sets, and we're going to try to study them. I'll explain this in the simplest case in a minute, in the case that g is 1 and n is 1. That's the entire lecture. It's only that, and that's only that case we really understand at this point, to some extent. Every question that in the linear theory is easy, strong approximation, has a principle, here becomes extremely difficult. We, we sort of have to proceed from scratch and even combinatorial methods are used. So it's quite appropriate for this. 
Let me just review. So I'm going to discuss the case of three variables, <coughs> in which case I have cubic forms. And the torus case, the split torus case, would be how many would be just the equation x1, x2, x3 equals k. This is not a difficult equation. That's just how many divisors k has. And that's not a case of any interest to us. If it were a non-split case, then it's, uh, as I described before, given by the Richlay's theorem. And it's the norm form equation of a cubic order. And again, it's controlled by the unit group. And I want to emphasize from the start here that tori are not rich, they poor. What do I mean by that? They will never satisfy strong approximation. Torus, a torus will never satisfy strong approximation. And that is, if, imagine I have, uh, it's exactly the following feature in a torus, you're eventually asking the following question. I look at the powers of two, maybe the generator is two and I'm looking mod p. When is two a primitive root modulo p? Okay, that's itself an interesting question. We don't know if there are infinitely many primes for which two is a primitive root mod p. That would be that I get all the solutions mod p by just taking powers of my generator. In the Dirichlet unit case, you have finitely generated a billion group. You know better situation. What is trivial is that for, for many p's, that's not onto. It's very easy to construct p's for which two is not a primitive root, and hence strong approximation fails miserably for a torus. But I want to tell you that that is something that may change when this equation becomes much harder. Because once randomness comes in, everything should be good. <laughs> That's what's going to be the theme. And also, just to make clear how little we know about cubic equations, so uh, if you were looking at x squared plus y squared, which is where I started, which numbers are sum of two squares? Well, we know that. Which numbers are sums of three cubes? Mankind knows nothing, absolutely nothing. There's a congruence obstruction. You better not be five or nine mod, uh, four or five mod nine. And other than that, it's possible that you always have a Hasse principle. If you go to a computer and look for the solutions, you, you don't find them because they're so sparse. But then people say, well, it seems there's no solution to k equals some specific number. And then somebody makes a bigger computation and finds a massive number. Model laments this problem as being harder than is pi a normal number? He relates it to that problem, saying mankind will never say anything on this. I emphasize I'm talking about integer solutions, not rational solutions. Uh, cubic surfaces of the rationals are quite easy. They're not completely understood, but relatively to this, much easier. So we don't know anything about this, except when k is 1, there's some very beautiful work of Lehmer. Now, you could ask whether this, the solutions are so risky dense. We don't know, except for some small value of k. You could ask whether it's infinite. We don't know. But one thing we do know is an extremely strong, the very strongest form of strong approximation, which is not to do with reducing mod p for large p's, but for reducing mod some specific number that's dependent on the k on the right-hand side, was first observed using, uh, Castle's observed using cubic reciprocity that you can, uh, that has a, the Hesse principle fails and was generalized by Heath Brown, Coyot, Thelen, and Wittenberg interpreted as a manin brauer obstruction. It'll come into what I'm talking about in a minute. In an, we have something similar in a second. Okay, so <clears throat> we know, that's about all we know about this problem. Uh, it could be that it always has solutions. And uh, I emphasize these solutions are very sparse. And I can even give you a forgive, given k and say, has this got a solution, specific number? And we don't have a way to proceed. There's no, there's no descent. And that's what we love is descent. And that's going to be our tool. All right, so the example I'm going to look at, which happens to be the representation character variety, uh, that's going to be a very important thing. There's going to be a dynamics. The group is, I'll give you the, all the things that are there. The group's going to be the mapping class group. That'll be the key group. The dynamics will be Teichmuller dynamics. So it's all this nonlinear Teichmuller dynamics coming into good old fashioned Diophantine equation, a cubic equation over Z. Those are the tools from dynamics, but there are many other tools, and I won't be concentrating too much on the dynamics. Uh, yeah, let's make sure which button. <laughs> So why can we study this equation? So this uh, is a, I'm calling this a generalization of Markov's equation. The k, it's k equals zero is Markov. And these are more general level sets. Sum of three squares minus the product equals k. So it's not homogeneous, number one. But much more importantly, 
There is a group which preserves the level set. And that group is as follows. It comes from an elementary switching of solutions of a quadratic equation. In the paper, Bergen, Gumbert, and myself, we call them Vieta transformations. I never used to call them that when we were looking at this, but then Bergen looked it up on Wikipedia, and he says this was called the Vieta transformation. Let me remind you what it is. So if I fix x2 and x3, then in x1, this satisfies a quadratic equation. And if I have an integer solution, then this quadratic equation has an integer solution, by definition, x1. And if you just check quickly, the other root of that quadratic is also an integer. And so if I flip the roots, I'll get another solution. And that's a transformation of this level set to itself, which, might, which is an involution. I apply it twice. I'll get back to where I start. So I get these moves. But, so that's called R1. And it's given by a formula. It's that formula, but it's not linear. It's a nonlinear involution, so if I apply it and then I apply, that's the application of it on the first coordinate. I could apply it on the second coordinate and the third coordinate, and if I do R1 and R2, then I get something serious. And if I iterate that, I'm getting a nonlinear transformation. So I get a nonlinear group of morphisms of affine three space which preserve the level sets. And this is an opportunity to use descent. In other words, if I want to study the solutions to xk, before, I don't know, maybe way out there, I don't know what's going on. Is there a solution? I don't see any solutions, small solutions. I don't know what to do. But now I've got this, move, I've got this group that allows me to move around. It's not acting nonlinearly, but it allows me to move around the level set. And I could try to reduce the height of the solution and just do descent to decide, for example, maybe there are no solutions. And this is true. This group acts sufficiently richly to have a descent algorithm. And it's due to, essentially due to Markov. In the case k equals 0, he said there's one orbit. We'll return to that. And this generalizes. So this allows a descent, allows a group, and that's our main tool. But what we're going to demand of this group are things that are nonlinear transformations and strong approximation for which there's very little theory. In fact, we don't know any. I emphasize the group is a highly non-abelian big group. So you will find many people studying the iterations of one transformation, but we have a non-abelian. This is essentially a free group acting on this. It's very close to the free group. <coughs> As I said, this is a special case of the representation variety. This is just the case of genus 1. And I'll end by saying what we expect and what is being done in general here. This should OK, and we're going to have to study the dynamics of gamma acting on affine 3 space. And amazingly, it's going to connect to pain of A6. And the algebraic solutions to pain of A6 are intimately connected to our study. Quite stunning and not, not something I was aware of when we were first working. I'll go through this as we go. All right, so let's forget the number theory. Let's get to the dynamics. And you could ask, what this, we have this group gamma. I should have said the group was generated by these three involutions, Vieta moves, coupled with uh, permutations. So it's a finitely generated group of polynomial morphisms of three space. It preserves reals, it preserves integers. That's the important thing. So let's look at the solutions on the reals. And this is a really genuine dynamics, was studied by Goldman. Uh, let me show you the pictures of what these level sets look like. <clears throat> so if k is 0, that's the case here of the Markov. Uh, the solutions are, there's a point in the middle there, and there are these four components, and the group acts proper, uh, it preserves 0, obviously, and it uh, permutes these four uh, pieces. And each of these pieces, it acts properly discontinuously. In fact, the group is the mapping class group in some coordinates, and this is the map, mapping class group acting on one of these components, is Teichmuller space. It's just the proper action. So there we have a good reduction theory without thinking. We know we can bring anybody out from infinity into a compact piece. It's a nonlinear action, but it's like uh, Gauss's picture, except we have a nonlinear setting. Now, as you increase k to 4, this little thing which was, excuse me, as you increase when k is 2, the little blob in the middle grows. So there's this compact piece and the group, this is what Goldman proves, that the group acts properly on these components. On this component, it preserves it. It's compact, it's got nowhere to go. There's a natural symplectic form and a symplectic measure with it. This is a symplectic action. And on that, it's ergodic. It's one of his main theorems, is on the compact piece, it acts ergodically, the group, which is very beautiful. Beautiful theorem of Goldman. 
Now I increase this to k equals 4 and I get probably the most important of these surfaces. It's called Cayley's cubic. And in that case, there are exactly four singular cone points. And this Cayley used to prove his famous theorem that on any cubic surface there are 27 lines of an algebraically closed field. This was exactly the surface at which he was able to make the computation. If you count parameters, it's clear. But that's not enough. You have to make sure something is not zero, and he computes it on this example. So this is a singular example to everything I'm going to say, because it turns out when k is 4, and it'll be a source of a Hasse principle and everything, when k is 4, that's exactly the case where this dynamics is conjugated to a linear action. And so it's actually secretly SL2z acting in some strange way in some other parameter space. The mapping class group in this case is group generated by <coughs> these involutions and uh, permutations is isomorphic as an abstract group to PGL2Z. But its action isn't the usual linear action. So that means uh, just knowing what it is abstractly is not so interesting. So you should just think of it as a free group, a little bit bigger than a free group. All right, and then as you increase K, you get, now that's, that in our case, bigger, and this is now connected like that. Let me go back here. So what I was saying here is when uh, k was 4, it's a Cayley cubic. When k is between 4 and 20, it acts ergodically, ergodically on this infinite volume thing. Even, but as I said, there's no set of measure 0, which is invariant in that sense. And when k is bigger than 20, Goldman shows there's a non-wandering domain. There's a piece that comes in which becomes, on which it's acting properly in some starting point. There's some open set where it moves out. So the dynamics over the reals is uh, described completely by a series of papers of Goldman. And this is the dynamics. It's the dynamics of the action of the mapping class group on this character variety. All right, so that's what we have over the reals. And now let's start with the Diophantine analysis. So this, all this work is joined with Gauche. <coughs> and I'm trying to understand when do we have a Hasse principle? And I remind you that even if we in the torus case, where we ask which numbers are norms of integers, the class number intervenes in a very concrete case where the action is linear. Even there, we don't have a description. There's no local to global principle. If the class number is bigger than one, that's easy to describe. So we shouldn't expect to really be able to understand this here unless we really have some great new insight or something. So we are a little more modest here in what we are going to try to do. Right. Okay, so in k is 0, there's one point, 3, 3, 3, and the orbit, there's one orbit, and there's the other orbit, 0, so they're exactly two orbits. So the class number, uh, in that case, you would remove this number, 0, 0, 0, because it's trivially fixed, and the class number is 1. And this is a famous theorem of Markov. Markov, when he made Markov numbers, Markov spectrum, I'll get back to that, uh, related that in a 1, 1 correspondence to the integer solutions of this equation, and then he remarkably showed that there's just one orbit. In general, the cl class number of these guys I'll call HK. I'll always keep away from K equals 4. I told you it's very singular. Everything's different. And we have these class numbers HK. <coughs> and I, the fact that there's a reduction theory in this general setting is due to really Markov. Hurwitz generalized it. And then Mordell wrote quite a bit about this equation. And that's just a, a statement that you have a descent method to decide whether there is a solution or not. All right, and we're interested in which case, for which a case is HK not zero, or for which case is HK zero. Those are failures of the Hasse principle. So firstly, I remove all the congruence obstructions. This is always easy to compute in these equations, because you now just reduce mod P, and then use the Chinese remainder theorem, then you're looking at that equation over a finite field. This is elementary, and you can see when it has a solution, when it doesn't. It's an equation in three variables. So unless k is 3 mod 4 or 3 or 6 mod 9, so unless you are on congruence is uh, mod 12, it turns out, you know exactly whether you have uh, congruence obstructions. So if there's a congruence obstruction, I forget about it. Obviously, there's no integer solution. So in those cases, there are no solutions. And I ask, suppose I pass all congruence obstructions. Is it true there's a solution? Is the Hasse principle true? So the number of k's up to k, I'm also going to remove, this is very important for uh, this nonlinear uh, fundamental domain. So I'm going to explain to you now something Gauche found which blew my mind. He found a fundamental domain like Gauss for this action. But you need some pre preparation. 
He wrote, firstly, let's remove all the solutions, all points in three space which have a coordinate which is 0, 1, or 2, or, plus, or minus 1 or minus 2. So if you remove that, you're left with k's which are very explicit, which we just remove, and we, the, what's left over we call generic. And the k's which we've removed, we can understand. So the generic k's are a positive proportion. They're exactly 7 twelfths of them. We know exactly what they are. And for the generic, and they pass the congruence obstructions, and we're asking which generic k's have an integer point. And we say, and that's where I'm going to compute the class number. And uh, to, to do have a good reduction theory, it was found by playing around with Bhargava cubes. So what are Bhargava cubes? Bhargava in his thesis, I remember when he came and showed this to me in Wiles, we said, who ordered that? You know, he's doing all this amazing thing, and then he comes and he gives a new interpretation of the composition of Gauss for binary quadratic forms using cubes, and he generalized that for other pre-homogeneous vector spaces. Quite stunning. So what you do here, this, doesn't, this is not the only way I'm going to get to a certain expression, but it, I'm telling you how it came, just for fun. <laughs> I could just write the final expression, which is uh, a, a, a very good function to do reduction theory. In other words, it tells me that if you minimize something, then you're in a fundamental domain. And uh, this was gotten by taking, uh, putting one and one, these on the opposite, the same variable on the opposite sides of the cube, and you form, with each two parallel slices, you form M1, N1, and then you make a binary quadratic form out of M1, N1 by taking T, M1, determinant of T, M1 plus uh, Vn2, and that gives you a binary quadratic form whose coefficients depend on x1, x2, x3, and you get three such forms. And if you do that, you, you can compute these three forms, and they have a nice relation that they have a common discriminant. And this is the key expression that's very, it's a symmetric function of x1, x2, x3, for which the Vieta moves are fantastic. In other words, if you Take a Vieta move, either you are in a position that I'll tell you now, or, uh, in other words, I'll give you a set such that every point in the orbit of these Vieta moves, in the, in the mapping class group, every element has a unique representative. So this, in many conferences, they draw this picture of Gauss, the fundamental domain of the modular group, this is, which is a linear action, projective linear action. This is a very exact same picture. And the main theorem is here, stated here, that as long as you stick to generic <coughs> and you look at this region, you just ordered, the coordinates are ordered, they satisfy u1 squared plus this is equal to k, so this is f of k, then every point, every integral point on our surface has a unique representative. So this, every integral point on fk intersect three, let me say it this way, every point in xkz with u1 of the opposite sign, so these are all positive, will have a unique solution, a unique representative in this set. So let me just give you a picture. Here's a case of where k is uh, 3658. And there is, sorry. Now, um, yeah. there's the fundamental domain <laughs> on the surface. It's given by a region which is defined very similar to Gauss. So the actual fundamental domain is very simple. The action is nonlinear, but the fundamental domain is very simple. And from that, he can do numerics, and we can start to prove theorems about what's the average value of HK, uh, on which Ks are hit, how, what's the percentage of Hasse principles are true, and uh, everything is computationally very easy. Here are all the solutions. They're very sparse, as I told you. But each of the orbits, there are exactly six points in this fundamental domain, and that's a completely general thing. So I, I really like this fundamental domain, both for computation and, more importantly, for theory as well. So this is how we're going to try to study exactly like Gauss did. Gauss was looking at the equation b squared minus 4ac equals d. This was a binary cubic, uh, ternary quadratic form. Now we're looking at this Markov equation. All right, so from the numerics, uh, one finds that uh, the, set, the, uh, the, uh, the HKs are roughly bounded, as we expected. We have descent. We're expecting to hit each guy roughly a bounded number of times. That's correct. And the class numbers, these Hs are basically bounded. They may get a little bit big up to log. Uh, I'm not saying we can prove that, but numerically they're very small. And it turns out 
and so here's something very interesting, is that the Hazard principle seems to be one to be true for almost all k's. In fact, the exceptions seem to go to zero, and they seem to behave like k to a power, and the power is somewhere near 0.9. So let me repeat what the numerics say. The numerics indicate that the set of these surfaces for which Hasse is true, in other words, there is an integer point, and once there is an integer point, there are many integer points, because I have this group that preserves integers acting on it, that then the guys which are exceptional, and there seem to be infinitely many, are about k to the point 0.88. I remind you that if I have a torus, the set of numbers, or which numbers are sum of two squares? That's zero density. So this is already very different. Almost all, almost all seem to obey Hasse principle. In fact, the exceptions seem to be a powerless in one. That's numeric, so what can we prove? <coughs> so just like in the Davenport, uh, once you start to average and you have a fundamental domain, you land up counting the number of integer points in a region, and that's a volume computation. And the only difficulty are the tentacles, and they are tentacles here, yeah? And that's where you have to work a little bit. And this is true in Davenport's work, in Bhargava's work on counting fields. In all those works, uh, the volume computation is easy. The difficulty is the tentacles. And here it's quite easy once you have Gauche's fundamental domain. So the class numbers are on average about k. Actually, there's a log k squared because of the tentacles, which is, of course, what we find numerically. There are infinitely many exceptions, so we found a money in brow obstruction. I'll give you examples in a second. Turns out we, this took quite effort, some effort. There are infinitely many k's for which Hasse fails, and we know at least square root k examples, explicitly in some sense, using some invariant, which is if there's an integer point, something must happen, and we show this thing fails quite often. And we can prove a positive, a little t. I learned this from some lecture I went to. A little t means you're still writing it up. So it means you can still remove it <laughs> if the details don't quite work out. So a little t, a theorem with a little t means being written up. I'm, I'm quite confident about it. Uh, anyway, so let me just state it anyway. Uh, that a positive proportion of k's, so the Hasse principle is true for a positive proportion of k's. So already this is very different to a sum of two squares or any norm form equation. And of course, there is no other equation that we can study of this type, which is degree uh, in three variables. All right, the key for the theorem here, uh, just on the proofs, is that this just requires Gauche's theory. That's then it's elementary once you have Gauche's fundamental domain. Uh, the Brouwer-Mannian obstruction is quite cute. It's based on the Cayley cubic and eventually a, a global reciprocity. The Hilbert reciprocity is used at some point uh, to get some global condition which has to be satisfied if there's a global solution. And using that, we can uh, show that there are many failures. The failures numerically should be about k to the 0.9. And I can give a heuristic argument of why that's roughly the right order of magnitude. So we know heuristically what's going on. We just don't have tools to prove anything beyond this at this point. And theorem three, I should say, uh, is, uh, there's a beautiful paper of uh, Bergen and Fuchs on Apollonian packings, which is some other exotic Diophantine problem about curvatures of integral Apollonian packings, and it's a lot, a lot of written about it. Uh, anyway, there was a question there about whether the curvatures, are, uh, there's a positive density set of curvatures in that setting, and Bergen and Fuchs found a very beautiful technique um, using quadratic forms in four variables, and actually using uh, Klostermann refinement to, uh, that's a terrible word, Klostermann's method, to deal with it, and uh, that was used here in what we're doing also in this little theorem three. So once you have Gauche's fundamental domain, this thing starts to fall into place to this extent. And that's all I know about Hasse principle for XKZ. We know much more now, and this is the rest of the talk, uh, about what happens for a fixed k for which I now have a point. If I don't have a point, there's nothing to say. I have a group acting on this, but I need to hit it on somebody <laughs> before I can start moving around and having many points. So from now on, I'll assume that I have a point. Sorry, those are examples of Hasse failure. So if k is of this form, they come from the Cayley cubic, and all the prime factors <coughs> of nu are either in these congruence classes then uh, there's no congruence obstruction, and there's no global solution, and that's coming from some algebra 
of a Brauermannian obstruction. This would be an example of our Hasser failure. All right, so the second part of this talk, and I think I have another 20, 25 minutes, uh, will go a little faster, and the techniques now will become quite a bit more complicated. So I'm going to assume I always have a point on the, an integer solution to my equation. I'm just talking about this cubic. So now I have infinitely many points, unless this were a fixed point or a finite orbit. So you quickly realize I better understand what are the finite orbits of the action of this group. And this was not known, and it's, I'll explain to you our solution, and it's connected to pain love A6. Just the dynamics of what are the finite orbits in, three, in A3 of this group, nonlinear group action. It's like, what are the periodic orbits? Beautiful question, absolutely important for us to understand. The question, however, now is once I have, I'm not one of these very special finite orbits, then I'll have infinitely many, and it's not hard to show you'll be Zariski dense. You won't sit in a sub-variety of the surface. Let me explain why that's the case. Imagine that I was stuck in a sub-variety of the surface. Then I would have integer points on a curve. And there's a famous theorem of Ziegel that if you have a curve, unless it's very special, there are only finitely many integer points on a curve of genus 1 or higher and genus 0 if there's a little bit side conditions on it. So you're not going to be stuck inside a small sub -variety. You'll be Zariski dense. So you already have many points. This is for free. The question is, can you have strong approximation for a cubic surface, for integers? And the answer seems to be yes. And this would be the, and these are the first examples of anything like this. So I'm going to reduce mod Q, and is this on to? All right, the whole point is I have this group acting on the integer points. If I reduce mod Q, I have the reduction of the group acting on the, on the, on the solutions mod Q, which is a finite set. So I have a representation of this group into the permutations on the solution set. Now, if any of you know anything about strong approximation for linear groups in the arithmetic groups, <clears throat> when you reduce mod Q, you're now just asking sub questions about subgroups of G, F, where F is a finite field. And the subgroups of Chevalier groups are well understood. That's not an issue here. But here we are the subgroups of the permutation group. There are many subgroups of the permutation group. So it's a, to ask what the image of this is, is now a quite tricky question, at least in our understanding. And this is what we're going to answer here. And even then, we don't have a complete answer at this point. So the question is, how big is the image of the mapping class group as it acts on the solutions mod Q of this equation? Elementary question in group theory. This is just a finite group question there. And it's completely connected to strong approximation because if I have finitely many orbits, imagine I have just one orbit over Z. If I want to get all the solutions mod Q, then I better have that this group is acting transit. This is a permutation group, better be transitive because if I want to get to everybody, I only have, only have one guy to start off with. So it's all about the transitivity question of this action. That's the question here. And this happens to be a question that has been asked in many different contexts, and we answer it. I want to emphasize that the number of solutions mod Q, this is a one equation, and when the minute you're working mod Q, it's easy to count the number of solutions. It's exactly, it's rough, but the order of magnitude is Q squared. So the set's getting bigger. I have these th three Vieta moves. And I have a chance to at least generate, because if you take two random elements in the symmetric group, they will generate if you're random. So this is the question of whether when God is making the solution, he's making these two generators sort of be random and that you get everybody. And of course, that's what you would expect. There's no, unless there's a reason not to. And that's, yeah. Yes. The group is basically, the, 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 the mother group here is PGL2Z. The free group, think of it as a free group. Three group on three generators, uh, or uh, two generators. You know. OK, there will be some dynamics when I serve later, when I state the theorem, is I want to just remind you that the number of solutions here is extremely sparse. This is what's making the problem. The, no, the action's nonlinear. When you have a linear action, you'll get a lot of points here of, so to speak, positive entropy. Here we're going to have like zero entropy all the time because there are very few solutions in a ball. I have those surfaces. You saw the pictures. I have the integer points on them. The number of solutions in a big ball radius t is only log t squared. This is an old theorem of Zagier in the simplest case, and it follows from the work of Mir recent, very recent work of Mirzokani using uh, Tagmuller dynamics 
in the completely general character variety case, in particular in this case. And k equals 4 is singular, because there was a linear action and there are many more solutions. So I'm never, k is never 4 in this. So I repeat that the integer solutions are very sparse, and we're looking at this strong approximation. Where's, when is it true? All right. Now, even, for me to even formulate what strong approximation says, when k is 0, it's going to turn out that there was just uh, one bad orbit. That was the zero, the two finite orbits, so to speak. But you could imagine that this group gamma acting on affine 3 space might, I might be trapped in a finite orbit. And let me point out that by Shabutarev's density theorem, I have the following enemy. Suppose I have a finite orbit whose coordinates are anything. A simple specialization argument shows you can assume that that finite orbit has algebraic coordinates. And then I have algebraic coordinates. I have this finite orbit for the action of the mapping class group in this nonlinear action. If I have that finite orbit, those coordinates lie in a fixed number field. If I then t take a prime which is completely split, split in that number field, then that orbit, then reducing mod p, will be the same as working mod p in the ordinary sense. And that finite orbit will be, I'll be trapped in there. So I can't expect that I'm acting transitively on all the solutions if I happen to be the coordinates of some finite global orbit over q bar. So whatever I'm going to prove, I'm going to have to face at some point the action on, uh, uh, in characteristic zero. And in fact, that is the final part of this argument that uses that. And we proved a, a fundamental theorem here which allowed us to pre proceed is that the, so now I'm, the thing of, uh, how shall I say it? Whenever you study something of the integers, you have to study it over everything else over the reals, over the complexes, over the piadics, over q bar. Only then have you the right to even guess what's true of the integer, so to speak. That's, so all the other parts are independently interesting. And the question is, what are the finite orbits of this action in affine three space over q bar? And we proved that using Lang's GM theorem. I was telling Schmidt that oh, we're going to use that. I won't get to explain this. But we proved that there are only finitely many finite orbits, and you can determine them explicitly. And I was quite happy with this, but I couldn't believe that this was not known. And finally, uh, on looking at some work of Cantat, who pointed to mathematical physics, I finally arrived at this amazing paper of Dubrovin and Matsako, in which they identify, they generalize the theorem of Schwartz. Schwartz's theorem, there, which hypergeometric functions are there? So F alpha, be, F alpha beta gamma z, for which parameters is that function of z an algebraic function of z? And the, that boils down to the monodromy group, a la Riemann, of this hypergeometric equation being finite. And the proof that everybody gives in any book today is that this is a reflection group, and you classify all the alpha, and Schwartz has a list of about 20 or 30 of these, maybe 50, I can't remember exactly how many there were. The pen lave equation is a generalization of the hypergeometric, which is nonlinear second order, same as hypergeometric. It's got singularities of 0, 1, and infinity. And the assumption is that the solutions are meromorphic in the plane outside of 0, 1, and infinity, and the only essential singularities are 0, 1, and infinity. And then you can compute, just like you do with a monodromy group, just like with a hypergeometric, if you start with a solution in some away from 0, 1, and infinity, and you go around a cycle around zero and come back, you'll come back to a new solution, which will only depend on the homotopy class of the cycle. This is just like Riemann. And you get a monodromy group, but it's acting nonlinearly this time, because it's not a linear equation. So you need good coordinates, and there's something called Schlesinger coordinates for the pain of A6. That's a pain of A6, by the way. <laughs> and what Matsako and Dobrovin are using, I'm not exactly sure. I think this does go back to Jimbo or somebody like that. Uh, that there are coordinates, so in a linear ordinary differential equation, you take the value of the function and the derivative at a point. These are bad coordinates for the nonlinear action. The much better coordinates, it's a surface. Obviously, it's a surface, two variables. And there are these coordinates relative to which, when you go around these cycles, you get the Vieta moves. You get the <laughs> mapping class group acting, and the coordinates are exactly this level set. And the theorem, as you might expect, that if time you go around the cycle, the question of whether pain of A is algebraic or not is whether this orbit is finite or not. It's completely, it's not trivially equivalent. It's a serious theorem. These are equivalent statements. 
So it was known that all you have to do is find all the finite orbits of this action in order to classify, just like Schwartz did, to write down all the algebraic pain lave sixes. Pain lave one, two, five, the monodromy group is abelian. It was well known even to pain lave the first few cases, I think. So this is, uh, was a beautiful thing solved by Dubrovin and Matsako. And they classified all the finite orbits just like we need them here. So, and then, I, and then I'm, I'm le reading, like, how did he prove this? He, is not, he doesn't know Lang GM. What does he know about Lang GM? Well, I saw him. I said, how did you prove it? I looked how he proved it. He said, oh, I used some algebra, <laughs> some work of Kronecker. And it's amazing. Gordon gave a proof of Schwartz's theorem by proving a lemma, which is the starting point of Lang's GM theorem, which I'll state at the very end. And they develop, that, ha that particular special case is enough for these guys to mimic Gordon's proof to give a classification. And they solved this problem beautifully. They write down all pain, so they got the analog of Schwartz's list for pain love A6, and it's in one-one correspondence with these finite orbits. And I need to know that before I even start to formulate what my conjecture is, or our conjecture. All right, so we now know that there are these finite. So for most Ks, this set is empty. So. Uh, and now the transitivity property of gamma, of these Vieta moves on the congruence classes, and now I'm only going to work modulo P, not modulo Q. P is a prime. So I look at the solution set. I first remove, I solve the equation over Q bar by this procedure, which gives me finitely many exceptions. Those I know very well. Let me forget about them. And then on the complement of that, the conjecture, this is our main conjecture, is that there's one orbit. The complement consists of one orbit only. In other words, the obvious trapping is there. We know what it is. And then everything else is one orbit, there, and that describes what strong approximation is, as long as we can prove the main conjecture. That's the main conjecture. In the Markov case, there's just two orbits <coughs> uh, over Q bar. It's some special pain lave, which uh, in, in this case is elementary proof. And the conjecture is very clean, that if you remove 0, 0, 0, the group acts transitively. This permutation group is acting transitively. And this is a basic and beautiful, I think, conjecture. We checked it numerically up to 100. It's not convincing. P is 100. <laughs> so I hope somebody checks it a bit further. Uh, but we have theorems. OK, so now I can start stating the theorem. So the main theorem is this conjecture is proved unless P is a number for which P minus 1 has a tremendous number of small prime factors. If p minus 1 were k factorial, our proof, there's a point in the proof we can't bridge the gap. The set of numbers for which that's true is tiny, so we're proving this conjecture for all but, should be all but finitely many p, our set is, I'll, I'll give the theorem in a minute. There are two steps in the proof. The first step, and this uh, is, the, the proof has some feature which is similar to Goldman's proof of the ergodicity. Somewhere, I mean, once you work mod P, everything is finite, compact, so there's no. And then you're trying to show there's one orbit. What does one orbit, what does ergodic mean in a finite set? It means there's one orbit. It's equivalent. <laughs> now, ergodic, if the sets are growing, would really mean that there's one big orbit divided by the number goes to one when the sets grow. And that's our first step, which is a much stronger statement. There's a big fat orbit, OP, such that the complement uh, is at most p to the epsilon for any epsilon. So not only is the ratio of this, not only is this orbit small, but it's really tiny. It's p to the epsilon for every epsilon. We could probably even improve that somewhat. Okay, remember that the number of solutions is p squared. So this is a strong statement. So you've got this big orbit. And more importantly, not more importantly, but as importantly, there is an orbit. Every orbit is not small. So as long as you keep, this is, of course, going to use the Q bar statement. As long as you are not in one of those trapped guys that you determined beforehand, then every orbit is at least size log P to the one third. So there's one big fat orbit and all these other orbits which are not supposed to be there at all. If they're there at all, they're growing a little bit. OK, that's a theorem for every P. To get the, the entire theorem, we now proceed further, we're going to try connect all these little orbits to the big orbit. We want the big orbit to eat everybody up. And then we run into some problems that require uh, 
beyond the Riemann hypothesis for curves, as I will explain in a second. I'll explain what's unusual in the proof anyway. All right, so it turns out we can prove this for most primes. So as I said, if p minus 1 is m factorial, we're in trouble. So here's the main theorem. The set of primes for which the conjecture is true is very, the set of exceptions to the conjecture is tiny. That is, the number of primes less than t for which it fails is at most t to the epsilon for every epsilon. That can certainly be improved. But we really don't know how to improve that to a finite set, which would be the main. We really want to prove that exceptions are only finitely many, and that we stuck at this point. Let me just point out that once you have the permutation group acting transitively, you should ask, what is the permutation group? And the old theorems of Jordan, they tell you that if you have a permutation group which is transitive in, in some other conditions, then it'll be either the alternating group or the symmetric group. And this was used by Puda and Meiri. Assume that you have the transitivity, which we've proved in these cases. If P is congruent to 1 mod 4, then in fact this group is not only, act, and this is very useful, their theorem, this is the, you don't just act transitively, but you are essentially as big as you can be in the permutations of the solutions. So the mapping class group is acting on these bigger and bigger sets, and it wants to really be the whole group. All right, let me just uh, go a little aside here before I say a word about the, what's unusual in, well, what's to me unusual steps in the proof. Uh, let me take the case k equals zero. Let me put a three here. I've been lying to you. That's really Markov's equation. There's a three there, and then the solution's one, 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 and there's one orbit, and the actual coordinates of the solutions are called Markov numbers. And they are very important numbers. They come up all over the show, and these Markov triples come up all over the show. I don't want to review why, but apparently almost nothing is known about the Diophantine properties of Markov numbers. I'm going to tell you this gives a whole set of new theorems about them. The only guy who said quite a bit about this was uh, Frobenius, and he asked the question that we will answer in a minute. Okay, so uh, these are Markov numbers. The Markov numbers are very sparse. They grow like log squared, as I've told you. And you could ask whether Markov numbers, are there infinitely many primes amongst Markov numbers? Okay, this is a lovely question, but this is not for human beings. It's like asking, are there infinitely Mersenne mer primes? These are not, these are very lacunary sequences. No sieve method works. We know basically nothing about those kind of questions. One, so you have a solution, x1, x2, x3, any solution, sorry. Where was the definition of the Markov? Yeah, yeah. Take a solution here, which is all coordinates positive. The mapping class group, uh, this group preserves the first quadrant. Take, and, and you also allow permutations. Take any solution, take any coordinate of any solution without multiplicity, that by definition is a Markov number. Any coordinate of any solution. So any projected of the solutions. And these are very sparse numbers and one asks about what their divisibility properties are. We know how many they are up to some height. And we're asking, are there infinitely many prime? I can't answer that. I'll answer something much more modest in a second. <laughs> this theory can be used to serve. So I told you Zagi I counted these, and Mirza Ghani can count them. The question of what, congruence are, what are the congruence obstructions to be a Markov number was asked by Frobenius in his major paper on Markov numbers. And he doesn't venture to conjecture, because at that time I don't think there were computers to check these things. But of course, our main conjecture t answers this, and our theorem tells you up to a set of primes which is very small that there are no congruence obstructions beyond the obvious ones. So a strong approximation is true for Markov numbers and our main conjecture, and whatever we prove is the best we know towards that conjecture. All right, our main unconditional theorem that, I mean, the theorem's unconditional, it's just there's an exceptional set. But even for that, we can already use that to serve. And we can prove almost all Markov numbers are composite. How disappointing. <laughs> you might say that should be trivial, right? Well, if you take 2 to the n plus 5 and ask, is 2 to the n plus 5 for how many integers n up to n is 2 to the n plus 5 composite? So it should be almost all integers of this form are composite. This, if you look at Hooley's book on sieve methods, this is the final chapter. He assumes the Artin conjecture. He assumes all, uh, some other things, and eventually he's able to prove this. This is how hard that question is. But he, he has no way of, uh, the Artin conjecture is not enough for him to prove that. 
The Markov numbers are a little richer because of what we know here to actually prove this theorem here. So almost all Markov numbers are composite. That's something you can remember. <laughs> so I'd much rather say about primes. This is what I can say. All right, and let me end. As we started, uh, he told me I could take that last five minutes that I lost at the beginning. Right, Marius? Oh, no, you're the boss. OK, so <laughs> you boss. <laughs> He's the boss. Uh, so let me tell you what's unusual in the proof. So what we have are these uh, moves. They're these Vieta transformations, which take me from integer points. Now we, I'm now discussing this mod p situation. So now we're in a finite field. And these Vieta moves are taking me from solution to another solution. They're involutions. They're actually called Dane twists in the geom where, they, where they're born from the mapping class group. They're Dane twists. And the reason I call them Dane twists is if we go to the more general character variety, this feature remains to be true. And it's a critical input. So we're going to look at these. And what happens, and the reason we can study this, is if I intersect the equation. So remember, I have the surface. If I intersect it with a plane, then I have an intersection there will be a conic section. So I'm in a situation that I'm very happy about what the solutions are, mod p. And if I have a solution there, I will have this involution. It will just flip to another solution. But if I fix one coordinate, I can do R. Suppose I fix the first coordinate. I have R2 and R3 to play with. I can take R2 composed with R3 and then permute. And that's really what I'm calling a Dane twist. This is now a rotation on that. And I could hope that this rotation generates all the points on the quadric. So I start with one point and I have this rotation. So the order of this rotation, and now this rotation is acting linearly in these two coordinates. So I could hope this rotation has a big order. And that's our main tool. Because if that rotation were full, I would get that whole conic section. And then I take another conic section and another conic section. And if they intersect, I can now, that's how I make my big component. This giant component is by taking such points and getting these big conic sections. And you can see where the enemy is, is at some point I have this big component, and now I want to connect somebody to the, everybody to the big component. And maybe I'm trapped. If I'm trapped, I must recognize I'm trapped from the global picture. And otherwise, I want to make sure I can get myself into this set. And the key lemma that we, we really taking this just completely elementary attack on this problem is to try inductively increase the order of the rotation that you have on your coordinates. So if you have a small order rotation on what you're sitting on, for that rotation, I then produce some number of points in that rotation. And then I can take one of those points and use its rotation to try to make it bigger. So I want a lemma, which is a two-step, to increase the order of the rotation. If I can prove that, then I can repeatedly increase it until some point I'm in the giant component. So I'm going to try to connect myself from anywhere into the giant component to prove the theorem. And what happens is that um, you write down the condition. And the only way we know to do this is combinatorially. You write down the condition that all the rotations you get have order smaller than what you started off with. You want a lemma which says there's some guy which has got bigger order. So you start with some order of the rotation of the Dane twist that you're sitting there. And you want to make sure you've got a bigger one. You write down, and you get an equation over a finite field. And you want to show that has the bad guys are few in number. And that is an equation over a finite field. And the equation is roughly this equation. Very simple equation. C plus 1, one over C. Eta plus 1 over eta equals C plus B over C. And B is not 1. And you want to give an upper bound for the number of solutions to that equation, where eta and C lie in a subgroup which is the order that you start off with. And the points are either in fp or fp squared. That's enough to look at. You need a non-trivial upper bound of power saving. And for that, if the order you start off with is bigger than square root p, then you can use Weyer's Riemann hypothesis for curves over finite fields very effectively because the number of solutions to the equation, so what Weyer tells you is the number of solutions to an irreducible equation is p plus 1, or affine form, p plus at most Square root p, that's the way we think of it. No, it's p, pl p plus square root p times the genus of the curve, because it's a number of eigenvalues. And if the genus is bigger than root p, v is useless. So if the order when you start off with is bigger than root p, you win by v. But if it's less than root p, you're screwed because v tells you nothing. So we need to do better. 
It turns out there's an elementary proof by a polynomial method of Weyl's theorem. It's due to Stepanov, and it gives more information. It saves us here. It gives us information all the way down to p to the epsilon. And it allows us to increase the order by using Stepanov's proof of Weyl. And this method, uh, I think Stark was the first to point out it's a slight improvement in Schmidt, but certainly has been used by people like uh, Heath Brown and others in, other, in some related contexts, but this is quite a bit more complicated. So we use Stepanov and we use a method of auxiliary polynomials. Uh, but again, blew my mind. He came and said, I'm going to give you a proof using combinatorics. I said, no, impossible. He showed, he went and proved about three years ago, nobody took any notice of this paper, it's in Contrandu, a projective Samaretti theorem over a finite field. It's not referred to this paper other than by us. I think he proved it for this purpose secretly somehow, <laughs> maybe some kind of, uh, And uh, in our paper, which is uh, uh, online, you can find it, uh, you can actually use Bergen's projective Samaretti Trotter theorem to actually handle this specific problem. You change it a little bit, he can't handle it, and uh, Stepanov is more powerful but for this problem. But what his theorem, uh, the usual uh, Samaretti trotter is about points and lines, and this is about a subset of PGL2 acting on projective space and then connecting, and how many incidences you have, and he gives a non-trivial upper bound, and that non-trivial upper bound can be used to give an upper bound up to the smallest order here. So he's got a combinatorial proof of this, and there's a third proof by Zania and Kovaya. We give all three in the paper. It's a very important input. All right, I'll skip the Lang GM, how it's used on that. Uh, let me just end by saying and repeating that this is just the first case of genus one, one puncture. This theory, uh, is, I expect, will be true for genus n, n punctures. So this is like a set of affine varieties which uh, the first thing to do is to study the geometry of them and to understand their relation to Voigt's conjectures because we have a lot of points here. And I have a student who's made tremendous progress here, Peter Wang, and he just put on the archive a paper proving that these general cases are log kalabi yao, which is the right first step to understand the algebraic geometry of these character varieties and uh, put it in the context of this theorem, these kind of theorems being quite general. Thanks.